Today is called The Nature of Order. Uh, the Nature of Order is a book that was written by Christopher Alexander. It's a four-volume uh, book published in 2002-2004 that he worked for, for many decades and that delves into the notion of the living world, living as a, as a continued process that evolves and unfolds and as something that, that breathes. And one of the central concepts for this book and of all Alexander's theory, I think, is the idea of wholeness. Um, and this idea of wholeness is, is a very interesting concept to me because it, it, it talks about how things are connected, are linked from the microscopic to the microscopic, and how uh, organisms adapt and re regenerate, and how they, um, it's in, in a way scientific, how who we can learn from, from science, how we can learn from biology, and how we can link um, together things. I, and I think you have a, a also a another term for it, the idea yeah, of wholeness. Um, so yes. the interesting thing to me about Alexander is he started out in, 1950s he was at Harvard uh, when Gropius was there um, and so you have somebody who has spanned this enormous period of the 20th century right up to the 21st century up to about 10 years ago and so he had this reputation at the time of being a very hard-nosed sort of analytical uh, his his PhD thesis was notes on the synthesis of form which is a very sort of you know, hard-nosed book. I think Alexander is not really well understood in some ways. But actually, that's, uh, there's a lot more to the story than that. And if you look a little more carefully, what you see is this idea of wholeness, or what the philosophers call Mariology, which is the ancient topic of part-whole relations, the idea that we can study the way that parts uh, not only are composed into holes, but transform into holes, um, generate holes, um, fragment into other parts, uh, generate more holes. You know, you think about the parts that make the whole, right? But do the leaves make the tree? Actually, the tree makes the leaves, right? So it's a very interesting set of ideas that Alexander, in many ways, helped us to unpack in the world of architecture, uh, this really goes back, uh, actually, a very ancient topic, and, and a lot of other philosophers who have uh, uh, expressed similar ideas, including Alfred North Whitehead, Rene Tom, and, and quite a few others. Yes, and I think one of, one of the ideas of uh, wholeness is that when, when he discovered the, uh, the atom and, and DNA and trying to figure out if architecture had DNA and how the, every atom is different yep. in a way, uh, they're not the same, such as, as, as the leaves that you were mentioning. Right. And I think that uh, also relates to the idea of the pattern, which I agree that sometimes is misunderstood, because the, I think the pattern language sometimes is uh, understood as, th as this rigid rules to make a building no. but in fact uh, calling it a language speaks about a grammar no. and about an alphabet and so a pattern language speaks about the notion that we can have a grammar and a different vocabulary from from you know a few elements it's a, it's a loose structure actually not a deterministic structure and um, in notes on the synthesis of form he was unpacking the idea that you can decompose a design problem into its, into its elements and into the way that those elements are related, what he called the forces. And this was something that other people were working on at the same time. Herbert Simon, his great paper, uh, 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 the Architecture of Complexity, where he observed that a design problem is nearly decomposable. And that word nearly is really important because you get these interrelating um, crossovers, uh, these sort of web network relationships that turn out to be really, really important. That's what he talked about in A City Is Not a Tree. Uh, that's really what he's what the, the essence of the pattern language is all about, is to take the essence of those structures and use them as a kind of rough guide, not as a deterministic structure, but as a sort of essence of the um, the most important relationships in the problem. It's all about relationships. There is a lot of that in his work of trying to uh, decompose uh, those relationships and understand how they go back together again in ways that are whole, that are 
uh, harmonious, uh, conducive to well-being, and also alive. And I love the fact that we just had this wonderful work uh, and, and the sense that the, the, the process is a living process. The soil, uh, there's life in it. There's, there's, you know, there's a sense of everything that's interconnected to everything else in some deep way. And um, I, I think that's really what he was trying to get at with patterns and with, with all of his work. And also he found elements in nature that were quite important to develop this pattern, which was symmetry and the void, and not, not really physical things, but also what happened in between all these um, elements that we, we normally don't see in nature. So mm -hmm. it was also about this invisible, uh, things that are interconnected in nature and bi in biology. When he was working on the pattern language, he shared actually some of the criticisms of the deficiencies. Not so much that it was deterministic, because that's not really what he was trying to do, but that it was incomplete, that it didn't address some of the geometric characteristics that are so important for part-whole relations, for Mariology, for for you know a sort of living uh, s living uh, structure as he call came to call it and begin to see 15 uh, geometric properties or fundamental properties um, that he observed uh, consistently over and over again in many different not only physical structures in the universe but architectural structures um, traditional art uh, many many structures where you can see these, these um, ge geometric uh, patterns that are very consistent. And it's quite interesting that he was able to come up with just 15 of them. Um, that maybe expresses the fact that you're, you're dealing with a, a fairly uh, straightforward kind of symmetry, as you, you referred to it. You know, there's, he's an observational uh, person who, who tries to learn from his own encounter with reality with um, experience and with shaping the world. You know, he saw architecture as the kind of ultimate scientific laboratory in a way that you're actually confronting the structure of nature when you're building the structure of human nature and, and human, human activities. Uh, quite fascinating, I think. I find very interesting that when, when Christopher Alexander was asked the question of what is the big problem today? What, what is one of our biggest problems? And you would imagine that any architect would talk about the housing problem, would talk about urbanism, would talk about this, you know, things that we all talk about. And he said, the major problem that we have today is ugliness. Mm -hmm. and, well, <laughs> and you know, pe people laugh at that, but th th that's because we have diminished the idea of what beauty is and what ugliness is to something that's commodified and trivialized. And actually, we are beginning to understand that there's something a lot deeper going on. This is coming out, by the way, from a lot of fields in the sciences like uh, neuroscience and uh, uh, environmental psychology and other fields where it seems pretty clear that what we regard as ugly is what is threatening to us as human beings. You know, what is likely to um, make us ill, um, it physically ill or emotionally ill or, you know, uh, unwell in some way. And th w there, there's a lot of research on this that we find that repulsive or we find that, you know, um, disconcerting. And the fact that a lot of people do think that the human environment is getting uglier and and the other thing that I find really interesting and frankly inspiring about Alexander is that he sees that we have choices. We're not powerless in this sort of, you know, world of uh, uh, economic forces and, you know, uh, cynicism and postmodern angst and all the rest of us. We made choices to get ourselves in this fix that we're in, and we have choices now. We maybe don't see them or understand them clearly, but but we do have them, and I think that's very, very hopeful. Yes, I think it goes beyond aesthetics, and I think that uh, something that you mentioned, which is quite important, is the idea of, which has to do with health and has yeah. to do with plenitude. Uh, this, these words that we don't hear often in relation to architecture, how could do you create uh, something with plenitude, which means also dignity. It goes uh, to a way of living that you can really find it uh, pleasurable, joyful, with plenitude. 
You know, that reminds me that um, one of the things Chris worked on in, in his last book called The Battle for the Life and Beauty of the Earth, he saw that we had sort of adopted a system and systems that are very destructive, historically speaking, that's only about 100, 150 years old, of mechanizing the world um, and of, of tr treating the world as a sort of reductionist problem. Very powerful, very effective in its own way, but also very destructive in many ways. And um, he talked instead about system A, which is the way that we've been building the world for the last, you know, uh, 200,000 years up until this period of m a much more adaptive, responsive, you know, contextual crafts-based approach. And the challenge now is how do we move not back to system A necessarily, but forward into what you might call B prime or something where we learn, we, g we grow out of this sort of teenage period with our, you know, uh, too many hormones and t too much sort of uh, arrogance and, and uh, hubris about how we can control the world and begin to respect the world and build a technology that respects the world, a technologos, a, a knowledge of making, you know, and, um, and that includes the economic aspects, as, as Howard was talking about yesterday, you know, the, uh, the culture of building, including the economics uh, that we've, we've built an economics of, of standardization and scale that's incredibly powerful. And it has generated a lot of wealth and it's pulled people out of poverty. But look at the downside. I don't think I need to tell anybody here how, uh, how catastrophic it's going to be if we don't recognize um, it, the dangers. And I think we need uh, to balance that. It's not that we need to get rid of economies of scale and standardization because Natural systems use those. The DNA is only one, you know, the four molecules that are standardized and, and you know, seeds, bil billions of seeds uh, at vast scales and so on. But they also have uh, economies of place and differentiation. And I think that is so important. And plenitude, yes. plenitude and repletion, the idea that, you know, we're d we don't just have an economy of depletion, which is what we have. We need an economy of repletion that regenerates our resources, regenerates our world. And I think that's what Chris was all about and always talking about on some level. It's interesting that you mentioned the idea of scale, because I think scale was, was one of the, of, of the major concepts to understand how his philosophy worked. And in terms of the city, in terms of thinking that every action situation can really um, affect the way that cities are lived. I was very surprised to find that some of the patterns do not talk about uh, the, f the, f the physical uh, world. They talk about uh, how people are, are living situations like a carnival. Mm -hmm. And he's proposing a place for people to, get to go crazy, to have you know, a space in the city to play, to dance. And these are things that are really uh, connecting the city. And then when, when he talks about the city as trees, also speaking about how um, the, the city is a receptacle for life yeah. and how this life has to be connected with, you know, through generations, through different works, through different, um, through different situations that happen every in, in an everyday life. A city is not a tree was a paper that Chris wrote in uh, 1965 and uh, was a very influential paper for a lot of people. Well, it's like um, a hierarchical relationship between the parts with no interconnections between them. And the opposite of that is a, uh, or the contrast that with uh, a web network or a, what he called a semi-lattice or, you know, like the idea of a rhizome, the, the interconnecting structure in the ground that um, actually we now know that uh, the plants are talking to each other and doing all kinds of interesting things, like language-like things. There's a language embedded in all of this as well. But um, A City Is Not a Tree made the point that you can't support living activities if you don't have the capacity for those interconnecting uh, relationships. Um, and that's something that we've unfortunately uh, not learned the lesson in, in our, uh, and that goes down to things like the way we design streets. Obviously those can be very hierarchical and, 
you know, you have arterials and cul-de-sacs and, and uh, those kinds of things, but also just the kinds of relationships that people can have, the kinds of relationships that spaces can have if they're too sort of linear and, and fragmented and, uh, and hierarchical. We used to think that was rational and sophisticated and uh, uh, scientific, and um, that was the model that, especially in the early 20th century, that we viewed the world uh, under. And uh, there were people who came along, like Chris, and Jane Jacobs is another, who talked about, no, that's not the way the world really works. We need to pay attention to the world, not our model of the world, and not impose our simplified abstract model on the world, but um, understand the way the world really is and make sure that our models, when we use them, are loose enough and language-like enough that we can accommodate the, the real life the the uh, the sort of bottom up life that's that uh, occurs in the city. It's interesting in this book, in the nature of order, how it took many decades, and of course he was doing some other things. But the nature of order really goes deep into not only the idea of a living world, but also to the spiritual. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also a very misunderstood part of Alexander, because but it, it, it went beyond also thinking about the cosmos. And I think that's a quite an interesting um, way in which he proposed that the nature of order was not only like the physical world, but it right. only went beyond to the cosmos, to the right. spiritual. It's an understanding that the universe is not a dead place. Uh, you know, uh, Alfred North Whitehead, who I, I, I think Chris uh, was very fond of, and I, I commend him to you all. Um, he, uh, there was a fairly slim book that he wrote called uh, uh, Modes of Thought. He con contrasted the idea that the universe is lifeless as a sort of model, but another way of looking at the world that actually conforms better in many ways is that it is fundamentally alive. And it's not only fundamentally alive, but we who are alive, who have a sense of our own personhood, we're not strangers in a strange land. We're in a world where there is personhood in the world, just as there's life in the world. Maybe we need a sense of the divine or a sense of the, the um, you know, the, 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 the connection in, uh, that he talked about in the nature of order. Quite interesting that in, uh, Alexander studied mathematics. Mm -hmm. So there is this opposite side to spiritualism, which in fact many of the theories and ideas that he proposed became um, really influential for design, for other areas and other disciplines. Yeah. And this is quite contrasting with you know, the nature of order. And so how do these two match? Well, here's an interesting uh, question. What does Wikipedia have to do with that building over there? And actually, the answer to that is patterns <laughs> in a very interesting way. Uh, so uh, what happened was uh, some years ago, um, a number of people, some, someone found the pattern language and the timeless way of building and sent it to a bunch of software people. And a few of those software people recognized that Alexander had his finger on a problem they were struggling with, which was, how do you make a wholeness in software. It, um, and they took this guy, Chris Alexander, and his patterns and applied that methodology. And pattern languages of programs, programming, or also called design patterns, are now a major domain of software design and, and software uh, technology. Um, it's an enormous field that has grown up around this idea of pattern languages. Um, and then those same people went went on and wrote something called the Agile Manifesto that is now a major um, influence in the uh, not only the software world but management theory, Agile methodology, uh, Scrum, the idea that you have teams, the idea that you have collaborative networks of people that are um, you know f solving a problem in a in a pattern like or language like way loosely and and trying to understand the nature of the problem. So what I take away from that is that, th you know, you said that ma the mathematics is sort of the opposite of this. In a way, it's not the opposite. It's more like the counterpart, you know. It's the structural um, um, dimension of all of this. 
And uh, I think in, in many ways, Alexander was a, uh, a structuralist, a neo-structuralist, you might say, uh, in, from a philosophical point of view, if, if those of you who know that tradition of understanding that language has a structure and it, it, it's an intermediary between us and our, and our culture and our world, and then the neo-structuralist who have taken that a, a bit of a step further. And I think we could talk even about uh, s what we could call symmetric structuralism, the idea that, yes, we have language, and yes, our language uh, is not the exact same thing as the world. We have to be careful not to you know, over-construe what our language is and impose it on the world like abstractions. But on the other hand, w if we understand that there's a resonance there and, a, and a, a, a real sense of meaning, a real sense of correspondence that we can work with, then language becomes an incredibly powerful generative force that we can use to generate beautiful, successful, you know, buildings and software and uh, cultures and uh, lots of other things in our, in our technology and maybe deal with a lot of our current challenges as well. I think uh, you, you're also interested in art and in, in the place of art. Sure. And, and how that connects to this opposites. I think it's, it's yeah. absolutely vital and, and uh, you know, it's so wonderful to see the, the artwork here. Uh, but it's also something that we have to be very careful about, just like we have to be careful about language and abstraction, and not allow the art to become uh, something that we impose upon the city. Uh, Jane Jacobs talked about this, actually, in uh, Death and Life of Great American Cities, her, her great landmark book, uh, uh, in a chapter called Visual Order. And she made the observation that we need art in cities. Art is a vital, you know, aspect of our of our lives. It enriches our lives. It, it illuminates our lives. It it gives us relationships and meaning and so on. But uh, the art is not the life. Those are two different things. And if we confuse those two things, we're likely to make bad art and bad life. And what we need to do is make sure we understand how to couple those things in a way that the art is enriching and illuminating and, and enhancing the life and not uh, you know, imposing itself on, on the life of the city, just like the tree-like structures impose themselves on the life of the city. You know, um, I, think the, the, uh, I, I think we could criticize some of the contemporary architecture today as being kind of like giant sculpture gardens, you know, that you, we haven't quite figured out how people are going to live in these, but uh, it's great art, so who cares? You know, just force them in, into these places. And then the other side of the coin is all of the terrible uh, places that we've allowed to uh, build uh, to be built that most people actually live in that of course the other dimension of that is we can too easily be corrupted by money and and real estate economics and and all the rest of it and that's another whole subject that Rim Kuhas and others have talked a lot about very uh, articulately I think. You, you've mentioned several times that he was friends with Rem Kuhas and mm -hmm. how uh, you know the star architecture which uh, populates the new cities and how that, um, it's about culture and the question of culture again. I think Christopher Alexander, one of his most known phrases is that um, the most beautiful places have not been built by architects, mm -hmm. but by the people. And I think it goes back to this idea of the people, of culture. We wouldn't go back to being bacteria or something, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but you do evolve and you do you know, incorporate some of the things. You reuse what works and you build on it and you, you know, elaborate it. I think, I think we need to move in that direction, and I think uh, that would be a very positive thing. Uh, I w there were a couple of things I w really wanted to get across, and one of them was just that um, I do think Chris is not well understood, uh, not only as an interesting figure in his own right, but as a, as a person who occupies a certain space in history. Um, the only question is, um, Will we uh, have any say in the matter, right? Will we have control? Will we be able to make it a more humane process as our technologies are failing us in because of some of the mistakes we've made? Will we learn from those? Will we um, uh, be able to 
transition to another stage of history out of this, I, I refer to it as teenage years, you know, uh, teenage technology. Uh, and I think the, it's a very hopeful thing what Alexander tells us. Yes, we can. We, we have the means. We have the choices. We have the understanding. And I think that's really uh, hopeful. And I hope everybody takes that uh, message from Alexander. <laughs>